Pokemon has been around for over 20 years now, and it's the most recognized property in the entire world. People of all ages know and love Pokemon, including yours truly. But Pokemon Sword and Shield are easily the most controversial games in the series, cutting over half of the franchise's Pokemon from the game and causing lots and lots of backlash from the fans. But despite all of this and the weird addition of cooking with curries, these Pokemon games have become some of my favorites of the series by creating one of the strongest single player experiences in the series and really streamlining the process of completing the Pokedex. So today, let's dive into the Gala region on this all new episode of The Completionist. We don't just beat the games, we complete them. I always love starting a new Pokemon journey, so it's time to grab my best boy Bulbasaur and complete Pokemon Sword and Shield. Yo, Bulbasaur did not make the cut, dude. Fuck this game. This is the worst Pokemon game ever. You cut Bulbasaur. I'm out. I'm out. You couldn't have, There's 400 of those bitches. You couldn't leave the coolest one in there? You had to cut my favorite? I'm out. This game's not worth it. Fuck it. Here comes a new challenger! Yeah! All right, so just about every Pokemon video I have ever done, I've talked about how Pokemon is the number one media franchise in the world. That just means everyone likes it, right? Well, that's not true in 2019. Pokemon Sword and Shield are easily the most controversial games of the year, and for a lot of reasons. The main reason for this was Dexit, a term made by combining Pokedex with Brexit, referring to the fact that for the first time in the history of Pokemon, you cannot possibly obtain every single Pokemon in a new mainline game. Now this made some fans furious because Game Freak wasn't cutting just a few Pokemon. They were cutting more than half. And while Game Freak offered a few reasons as to why they made the omissions, those excuses didn't matter to a lot of fans. Those fans didn't care about improving animations and balancing competitive gameplay, at least not at the cost of their beloved pocket monsters. Those fans felt that Game Freak might as well just have thanos all of those Pokemon for good. But what was really fascinating to me was the positive backlash caused by angry Dexeters. Almost immediately, there was a new hashtag trending on Twitter, Thank you, Game Freak. There was word that the employees at Game Freak and their mentalities was at an all-time low. And in these tweets, fans supported the workers who were getting depressed by all of the angry comments online. These fans shared all of the positive influences the Pokemon series has had on their lives. This was absolutely heartwarming, and while it didn't stop the negativity, it was still nice to see this wave of optimism come out of some toxic comments. But then the negativity came back in full force when it turned out that the promised improvements in animation weren't that great. Not only were a lot of models reused from the previous 3DS Pokemon games, but the cities and routes felt barren, and there were massive amounts of technical problems including pop-in, especially in the brand new wild area. It looked more like a good 3DS game and less like a premier Switch title. Also, there were weren't that many changes to the basic Pokemon formula. You're a 10 year old kid who wants to be the very best like no one ever was. Wander from town to town, become the champion, and catch them all. I get that this is the same bait story and mechanics Pokemon has always had, but it does its job. It's like a cheese pizza. It's fine on its own, but you can always add new toppings to it. And when the game finally released, the reviews were mixed in a unique way. Critically, this game was received very positively. It averaged an 80% on Metacritic, but the user reviews were drastically different, coming in at about four and a half out of 10. So where does this leave me in all this? Well, I'm a bit nervous. Not because of the negative comments, but because I am the completionist. It is my job to do everything possible in a video game. And the last time I had to complete a main Pokemon game, game, the Gen 3 titles, it took my friends and I over 500 hours. That is insanity! And now I have to do this by myself for both Sword and Shield! I don't have that kind of time on my hands to do this alone. If this game is going to keep my interest, catching Pokemon needs to be streamlined and the main story needs to be bigger than ever. Fortunately, neither were an issue. Call me 
a weirdo, but I'm one of those people who always loved the single player experience of Pokemon. Meeting rivals, challenging gym leaders, and becoming the champion has always been a blast. And I firmly believe that Pokemon Sword and Shield does this better than any other Pokemon game. Every Pokemon game follows the same basic structure collect the gym badges, battle the Elite Four, become the champion. But how does this happen? Who decides who gets to become a gym leader, what order they're in, and why is the champion the best? Well, Sword and Shield answers those questions. In the Galar region, all the gym leaders and one trainer take part in a tournament to decide who is the strongest, and the winner of that tournament goes on to battle the champion. How well they all fare determines the gym order and even whether they'll be sent into the minor leagues. Think about it, there's a cool Pokemon Gym Minor Leagues. How cool would it be to explore that in the future games? Every gym battle is seen as a major sporting event, almost like the World Cup. Every final battle takes place in a huge stadium with a ton of fans around you. And once the gym leader is down to their final Pokemon, they Dynamax them, turning them into huge, intimidating beasts. Dynamax is a phenomenon that only occurs in the Galar region, replacing Mega Evolutions and Z-moves. The Pokemon grow giant, sometimes changing forms, and execute incredibly powerful Powerful moves with amazing secondary effects. And you can do this too, causing the fans in the stadium to start chanting and singing like you were playing in the World Cup. Gym battles in Sword and Shield actually make you feel like a star athlete, more than any other sports game this year. Let's compare this to the gym experience from most of the other games. You walk in, battle a few trainers, beat the gym leader, and leave. Gym battles in Sword and Shield feel like an event, not just like something you have to do to beat a video game. This is further helped by the awesome gym leaders. Each one is memorable, from Alistair, a young ghost trainer who always is wearing a mask, to Raihan, a weather-based dragon trainer who is also a social media influencer. But my absolute favorite has got to be Opal. Opal is an 88-year-old fairy trainer who has been a gym leader for 70 years and desperately wants to retire. She is constantly quizzing everyone and trying to bring out a trainer's true colors, which for her has to be pink for some reason. She is persnickety, stubborn, and I love her. If you told me a month ago that one of my favorite gym leaders of all time would be a cranky ass old woman, I wouldn't have believed you. Now, I want to see where her story goes. Although going on these gym challenges is a blast, you're not the only challenger. Like every other Pokemon game, there are some rivals. Pokemon's recent rivals have gotten a lot of criticism for just being nice people who give tutorials. While there are still a bit too many tutorials in Sword and Shield for my liking, I think the rivals are a massive improvement. There's Beatty, an arrogant jerk a la Blue, Marnie, a cool girl with her own fans following her around called Team Yell, and Hop, the nice guy who gives tutorials. And believe it or not, I found Hop to be the most interesting. Not only does he have you for a rival, but his older brother is the current and greatest champion that the Galar region has ever seen. Naturally, he wants to take the throne, but there's a big wall standing in his way, you. Normally, when the nice guy gets beaten all the time, they just give an oh darn and say that they're glad that they are your friend. Hop instead gets filled with doubt. Is he really a good trainer? Is he letting his brother down? If he is not the champion, then what will he be? That's pretty introspective for a character in a Pokemon game. And the other two rivals go through similar journeys as well. Of course, this all ends with the champion we mentioned earlier, Leon. There have been a lot of great champions in previous Pokemon games. Steven and Cynthia come to mind. And Leon definitely deserves to be right up there with him. One of my favorite things about him is that this game begins and ends with Leon. The game starts with a cutscene of Leon battling Raihan, followed almost immediately by him giving you and Hop your starters. Normally, players get their starter from the region's professor, but starting with the champion shows how strong you can get. See this guy that everyone loves and is the strongest trainer in the world? You two? can become that guy, and that alone is excellent motivation. Even after you beat the game, Leon sticks around. He runs the Battle Tower, a building where you can create competitive teams and test them out in unlimited battles. He creates it with the goal to make Galarian trainers the strongest in the world. All right, so while the Battle Tower has been done in the past in most of the Pokemon games, it's a lot simpler here. After every couple of matches you win, you go up in rank. Each rank gives you a ton of items, including points to buy items and TM, this is the place to train a competitive Pokemon if you like to engage in online battles or in the VGC. It's also the first time that I feel that you can learn about competitive battling in a Pokemon game. They offer rental teams that are 
are actually pretty good. It's a lot of fun and I enjoyed it a lot more than the previous Battle Towers. Leon did a great job because not only does he give you the opportunity to be the best trainer in the Galar region, but the best in the real world too. All that being said, the story isn't perfect. The main villain's motivation and logic are never really justified, and Marty's fans, a Pokemon version of soccer hooligans called Team Yell, can get really annoying at times. But the gym experience overshadows all of that. I want to see how the Galarian minor leagues work. I want to see how Opal's protege does as a gym leader. It's the first Pokemon game where I actually want to see what happens to our characters next. So you're hearing it from me first, viewers. Please, Game Freak, make a direct sequel to Pokemon Sword and Shield. All right, so I've gone on for a while. I have to address Dexit. The culling of 490 Pokemon from the roster was shocking, and I understand why a lot of fans are upset. I lost a ton of my favorite Pokemon from the years. But from a completionist's perspective, I think cutting over half the Pokemon is a godsend. Now before you all get angry and rush into the comments and call me an idiotic beta Kakuna, hear me out. Yes, it sucks that a ton of popular Pokemon are gone, and I definitely miss them. But you cannot deny that having to catch 890 Pokemon is ridiculous. I was already getting fatigued trying to catch all the Pokemon in Generation 3, and there's only 386 of them. And there are now more than twice that many. If Gen 3 took over 500 man hours to complete, then having to catch all the Pokemon now could theoretically have taken more than a thousand hours of playtime. I don't have that kind of time. Cutting it down to 400 is still a daunting task, but it's much more achievable. And to make it even more comfortable, Sword and Shield really optimized the process of completing the Pokédex. In the older Pokémon games, if you wanted to level up a new Pokémon you just caught, you'd have to go to the town, go to the Poké Center, boot up the PC, and then move the Pokémon around as necessary to put it into your party. However, at almost any point in Sword and Shield, you can pull up the Pokémon part of your menu and get access to every Pokémon you've caught, like in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. This is fantastic, and it allows me to optimize my whole team on the spot to take on gym leaders or just fill my team with Pokémon I need to level up. Not to mention that you can basically fly to any of the towns or routes you've been to at any time early in the story. This optimization makes catching every Pokémon so much simpler and not nearly as tedious. There's also the matter of where to find all of these new Pokémon. While you can still find a good amount of Pokémon on the usual routes you can find in any of the games, Sword and Shield boasts the coolest catching experience of all time, the Wild Area. Now, the Wild Area is a free-roaming zone where you can control the camera and all kinds of Pokémon meander around, waiting to be caught. All you have to do is walk up to them and a battle begins. This is an experience Pokemon fans have been dreaming of since Red and Blue first came out. A game where you can just wander around, control the camera, and catch Pokemon. And the variety of Pokemon is staggering. They range from little low-level pals to gargantuan level 60 beasts. I literally got stuck here for hours just running around and trying to catch every Pokemon I could. I forgot to progress the story and I didn't even have a single gym badge yet, which left things a bit restricted. The level of Pokemon you can catch is dependent on how many gym badges you have. The more badges you have, the stronger Pokemon you can catch. And yes, this does make sense from a balance perspective, I did find it a little frustrating. Let me catch the Pokemon that are too strong to, and make them impossible to handle. You know, like in the previous games. This was a little frustrating, but it made more sense. If you catch a level 60 Pokemon before the first gym, you freaking earned it. Of course, that's not the only way to catch Pokemon in the wild area. There are also the raid battles. Around the area are dens with a beacon of light coming out of them. If you access them, you get to take one of your Pokemon with you and battle a wild Dynamax Pokemon, and you're gonna need some friends, folks. Up to three players can join you online in taking down these behemoths. This not only gives you access to incredibly powerful Pokemon you can only find here, but it continues to promote the most important idea behind Pokemon, connectivity between friends. This continues into the wild area when you have internet connectivity turned on. You can actually see other players from around the world traveling around the wild area. However, this game gets incredibly laggy at these points, and more often than not, it shows these people frozen in a single spot. I would recommend keeping the connectivity off, except for right when you want to do a raid battle or do some online battling or trading. Otherwise, you're going to be moving around the wild area like a slugma going uphill. I completely see why fans are mad at so many Pokemon being cut from the game. 
It sucks, but I'm okay with it. Cutting all the Pokemon and optimizing the game in so many ways makes this the perfect game to complete the Pokedex in. But unfortunately, Game Freak couldn't leave well enough alone. Catching all 400 Pokemon was a lot of fun, but you have to fill in all that time with something, and that's where the Curries come in. And the Curries, in my eyes, completely ruin the entire completion experience. Almost every Pokemon game has had some kind of side thing where you can watch your Pokemon be cute and adorable, like the contests or musicals. That thing in Pokemon Sword and Shield is the camp. In the camp, you can play with your Pokemon, visit other players' Pokemon, and cook Curries for your party. This is actually really cute and a lot of fun. Plus, it has some genuine benefits for your Pokemon. It gives them experience, and if you cook the curry well enough, you can completely heal your entire team. And normally, that would be it. It would be a fun bonus thing you can do, and there's no reason to include it as a part of the completion process. But Game Freak had to go ahead and make it more complicated than it needs to be, with an overly laborious collection process and an unneeded set of collectibles. Now, you have to find a ton of different berries and ingredients. Then, based on what ingredients, what kind of berries, and how many berries you use, will get you a different kind of curry. All the different curries you can make are on a list called the Curry Decks. How many different curries are there? 151. There are as many curries as there are Pokemon in the first set of Pokemon games. Basically, I have to complete a whole game's Pokedex, but instead of fun battles and exploration, I have to do the same simple minigame over and over again. Game Freak did so well making catching every Pokemon so much easier. Why on earth would they include this? It is everything that was making me so tired of completing Pokemon games in the first place. It's tedious, repetitive, and it takes way too long. And while it only took me a few hours at most, it felt so much longer. This feels like Game Freak took a long look at Breath of the Wild and said, hey, we want to do that and track it. So they created the wild area and cooking. Now I know the wild area is not nearly as beautiful as traveling around Hyrule, but it is still a charming and magical experience. They took the basic cooking mechanic from Breath of the Wild and turned it into a mini game that outstays its welcome and makes completing the game kind of miserable. Look, I get adding in mini games to add variety to a game. In fact, I'm all for it. But it feels like Game Freak is trying to take up the space left by all the Pokemon that are gone with something that doesn't nearly have as much personality. Look, I'm gonna be real with all you guys at home. I am a Gen 1 -er. I know. Okay, Gen 1 -er. I am the boomer of the Pokemon generation. The Gen 1 aspect of my life has been stuck with me. And while I have done Gen 2 and Gen 3 and soon to be Gen 4, and I've done Gen 1 three times now with Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee Pikachu, this is my first new, true new Pokemon game in years. And I have to say, I'm obsessed in a very unhealthy way. I love doing the raid battles. I love getting all the Gigantamax Pokemon. I love hunting for shinies. I can't stop hunting for shinies. I have one of the weirdest team comps out there that no one gives a shit about but me, okay? I have been so invested in this stupid fucking game that I have, my whole team is six shinies. I have six shinies up in this. Six of them. Aegislash, Rapidash, Ludicolo, Darmanitan, Dragapult, and Beware. It's weird, I know, but I became obsessed. All these bitches, six IVs. All their EVs, appropriate to their nature. I have gone above and beyond. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. I have been in the Patreon discords, talking to my fans. They've all been helping me hunt these motherfuckers down. It's weird. It's weird. Think about what I've said so far, okay? I have a lot of complaints about the visuals. I have a lot of complaints about the cutting of the Pokemon. And yet, it's one of the most fun games I've played this year. And I can't put it down to the point where I have hunted over 4,000 times to get an egg with six IVs, the right natures, the right hidden moves, the perfect EVs, and all the right holding items right here. Somebody help me!
Pokemon has always been more about the journey than the destination, and this has often been true for their completion bonuses. Completing the Pokédex definitely took some time, but there were some occasions where it felt genuinely fun to see what certain Pokemon would evolve into. But that doesn't excuse the fact that finding one or two Pokemon took way too many hours. Now, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to Austin John Plays, Rai2987, Nightshade, Randomized Games, DG, Destroyer of Worlds, and What a Geek for joining me in several raid battles and helping me fill in the final two spots of the Pokédex, as well as getting a few perfect six IV dittos. Also, a big thank you to all of you on the Patreon Discord who helped me fill in the decks quite a bit, as well as all those random players out there who actually gave me a decent Pokémon through surprise trade. Seriously, some of these Pokémon players are far too generous with their trades. So after beating the game, you can go to Sir Chester and enter the West Hotel. In room one, you'll find the game director, and he will give you a charm that makes it easier for catching Pokémon via critical catches. However, after completing the Pokédex, you will get a shiny charm for catching every different Pokémon in the game. The shiny charm greatly increases your chances of catching a shiny Pokémon, an incredibly rare version of a Pokémon that has different color schemes. But that's not all! For completing your curry decks, head to the Hammerlock Hills in the wild area and meet with the Camping Guru. He will give you the gold cooking tools. This is useless because I do not want to cook curry anymore after this. This chef has been chopped. If Game Freak had left out cooking all the curries, I'd be riding sky high right now. Pokemon Sword and Shield is not perfect, but it is a lot of fun, but cooking all the curries really ruined the completion process for me, and no pun intended, left a bad taste in my mouth. I talked about this earlier, but I am a little bummed with the overall presentation of Sword and Shield. Don't get me wrong, I love the gallery Region, I love the setting, I love the music, I love the presentation of the entire game. However, I truly believe that this game was not ready for the Nintendo Switch hardware. It seemed like it was designed for the Nintendo 3DS and then roughly brought over to the Switch. If this is our first real Pokemon game on the Nintendo Switch, then I do hope that Game Freak puts more time in to make sure that it runs properly. But despite these hiccups, I had a fantastic time with Pokemon Sword and Shield. When I completed Pokemon Sword and Shield, there were one time I was overwhelmed by defeat, because I didn't know what the game said after you lost a battle, so I had to find out. 44 ranks earned in the Battle Tower. This was between two playstyles across two games, but it never felt tedious. I enjoyed completing it much more than the Battle Frontier in Gen 3. 302 curries cooked, 151 for both games. This is incredibly unnecessary and gets old really quickly. I loved the Pokemon camp, but I hate having to cook all these curries. 400 Pokemon caught. While I miss a lot of the Pokemon drop from Sword and Shield, I am thankful as a completionist that I don't have to catch all 890 Pokemon. I would not be surprised that as more Pokemon services come out, that they retroactively update Pokemon Sword and Shield to feature more and more Pokemon. 305 total hours of playtime between both games. And one long ass in memoriam section that I'll have to watch at the Poke Awards this year. All joking aside, while I'm not personally upset with the cutting of over half the Pokemon for this game as a completionist, I do understand why people are mad. A lot of favorite Pokemon are gone, and the game really doesn't look good enough to justify Game Freak's reason for those cuts. There are some weird graphical pop-ins, and there's a lot of lag in the wild area when you're online, and that's kind of shocking. Not to mention how unnecessary and tedious cooking all of the curry is. But this game has some of the most memorable gym battles and characters within the Pokemon series. And catching and battling Pokemon is as addicting as ever. I have already sunk so many hours exploring the wild area, doing raid battles, breeding, all kinds of crazy stuff. And despite all the controversy, this game gets one of the most important things right. It's absolutely fun. And while I can't use Bulbasaur in this game, I know that he'll always be with me physically in this office and in my heart. So, with all that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It! That's all time for today, guys, so please, as always, let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. Guys, we're at the end of the year. This is going to be our last completionist, new completionist episode in 2019. Thank you all for all your hard work. We didn't win a streamy. We got second place in the Mario Maker 2 Invitational. We were in a Sonic commercial, but you know what? All that is sick. I'm so happy to be here doing what I'm doing. Thank you all so much for the support. 2020 is going to be more insane. Bigger goals, bigger achievements, and more importantly, 
more of you to join us along the way on this journey. I can talk today, I swear. If you're new to the show, do me a favor, check us out. Hit the subscribe button if you'd like. Leave a comment down below on what episodes you want to see here on the future of the show. Guys, I've been Joy the Completionist, and have a great holiday wherever you are in the world. Bye.